So we're going to be able to do uh, very easily optimization program. But just a little history about the tool. It was developed by Jean-Louis Clouot, the professor at the uh, University of Grenoble in France, not very far from where we are. In fact, it's a good friend of us. In the 90s, the first release was done in uh, 2011. It was uh, kind of a half-baked release. We had some connection, but they were not all very good. And then uh, what we did is in, two, in, uh, in June 2013, so about eight months ago, nine months ago, we released 2.0 with the connector, an easy connector for uh, flux produce and impact. The current version is SP1 released in December. So let's look at the main features. So, you know, the end uh, doing, uh, doing an optimization process is quite difficult. You have many, many parameters uh, that uh, may or may not affect your solution. It depends what uh, people are to be allowing, allowing you to change. Uh, those uh, optimization may be mono or multi-objective. So, for example, I want to get uh, I want to get the best uh, torque output, and I want to get the lowest power. So that's a multi-objective. Or, for example, on an induction machine. I want to get the best torque at locked rotor, I want to get the best torque at maximum torque, and the best torque at rated condition. So again, this would be multi-objective. And it can be with or without constraints. So I want to get the best torque with the smallest torque ripple. So torque ripple becomes a constraint. The objective is the best torque, torque ripple is the constraint, or with the lowest uh, with the lowest or with limiting the losses, for example. And then once we have done the optimization, we want to see how stable the solution is. So we're going to do uh, a worst case uh, scenario. We're going to try to look if we vary some uh, parameters, is this optimum stable or is it going to change very fast? So we, it really what we want is the best solution but that varies very little because when we build machine, uh, the machine is only as good as the capabilities of uh, the factory or the tools. You always have some mechanical, uh, some mechanical uh, unknowns. You know, it's maybe a little bigger, a little lower, smaller, or it may have a different type of surfaces and things like this. And so we need to know how stable this is. And so, because this gives you a lot of, uh, it gives you a lot of the variables that you can play with, uh, it is actually very interesting to do a screen. So, if I have a motor, I have the two threads, I have the slot, op slot opening, the length of the magnet, uh, the radius of the rotor, and a lot of other things like this. But if I try to get the torque, maybe some of them don't apply. So then there is no reason for me to include them in the optimization. So that's why I need some very good screening functions that are going to tell me this parameter, this parameter, this parameter are the most important and just focus on those one only. So again, screening optimization, robustness. And all of this is based on a lot of uh, uh, parametric analysis, trying to develop surface responses and things like this. So the screening, and we'll look at it a little later, uh, the screening will uh, identify the most influential parameters. So, I have an objective function, so getting the best, uh, getting the highest torque. So it's uh, it's actually expressing kind of a function, and uh, and uh, now I'm going to see, for example, find out what is going to give me the highest torque. Actually, in fact, this is uh, well, I think it probably is the torque. Uh, so or it's the losses. I don't know. Yeah, it's the losses. Uh, optimizing the losses of a coil. So. In this case, it's going to tell you well if you increase if you increase the uh, the current in the coil, you are going to increase the losses. Well, it makes sense. Everybody would be able to tell me this. I don't need a program. But what you can see here is that if it's positive, so it means if I increase this, I'm going to increase the losses. If I look here, the coil, the the height and the width of the coil. Guess what happened? If I increase the surface of a coil. I lower the resistance and make the losses go down. So in this case, if I those parameters are going to act negatively on the function. 
So if I increase the height of the coil, I'm lowering the losses. So out of the screening here, I get a lot of information that tells me, you know what, this parameter is going to go this way, this parameter is going to go this way. And then after I can see the most important one. So I can see here, I don't know what uh, EPS2, S2 or t -core. So t -core must be the, the tooth, for example, uh, the depth of the slot, maybe something like this. Uh, I can see those ones don't have as much effect as the first three. So the current, of course, is important, but we don't have always a choice. And then eventually, it will look at the product of some of the things together. So here we have a product of the current multiplied by the height of the coil and then the product of the teeth widths, I guess, by the width of the coil. So it's actually telling us, well, if this product go up, it's going to go down a little. Yeah, sometimes it gets pretty difficult, so after a while, you know, it's, it doesn't rain very much, but the screening at least will give us information on what the most important things are. So, once we have the screen, what, what we're trying to do is basically find surface response. So, we're going to look at the variation of the parameter uh, versus uh, two, uh, uh, var uh, the variation of the, of, the, uh, of the target function and uh, the goal function and we are the objective function, I'm sorry, the objective function and we're going to look at how it varies depending on some parameter. So, I can actually find surface responses and then, once I have the surface responses, I can actually find the optimum or the minimum, and I can find if they're stable or not stable. So, of course, if I have a hole right in the middle, it looks like I have one right there. This one is going to be very stable. I'm in. On this one, I cannot say very much because I'm missing part of the of the curve to really make sure that it is okay. So that's the other the other way. So here, for example, I'm doing a okay. It doesn't really matter, but I'm doing an optimization of the losses, uh, and I'm looking at the, so the objective is the losses, the magnet volume that I want to reduce, and though my, my constraint is saturation of the torque, so I'm going to find a, a variation like this, and then I'll be able to find the optimum. Now, if I have more, actually, when I have more than one parameter, like before I had the losses and the torque, now I have two, uh, uh, two functions, and now I need to find uh, the combination between those objectives, find which one are down and not down, and so I can actually plot this in a different way, uh, which is called the Pareto front or Pareto frontier. And uh, what it's basically telling you, it says usually you have everything, so we have everything uh, on, on top of the slide, so it means anything here is not feasible, and then we have a, a population which is a lot stronger and probably the optimum is somewhere right in the middle. And so as I said, once we have the optimum, it's the robustness, so I have the variation uh, of the objective function versus different, uh, different uh, parameters, and now I can see how it varies. So I can see, for example, that sensitivity on x1, or it's, it's, it's actually, if I move x1 one way or the other, the objective function is going to move very much. So I know careful, this is a parameter that will affect my result quite seriously. On the other hand, along this parameter here, I can see I can move there or there. It doesn't change the objective function, so it's a very robust parameter. No matter what I do, I probably will not kill my, my optimum. So the other thing you can do is you can do directly parametric analysis in God. So that's, uh, the first level actually where you'd be able to, it's, it's a little the same stuff that you could do with flux but it's all it's driven by uh, by Proteus and then you get a lot of, uh, of uh, surfaces you can plot, you have a lot of tools that actually let you uh, plot surfaces and things like this. Uh, again, it's some things you can do but it's in a better environment and more we'll see after is that it's uh, it can be uh, distributed. So this is, okay, the different uh, Different type. Uh, basically, this this, this is the uh, the function of uh, of uh, doing uh, the optimization. So, what do we want to do? We want, if we just think about it, every time we do um, every time we do a computation in a flux in a finite element tool, it's going to take time. Every time we have to call flux, it's going to take time. So, if we can actually 
through uh, a design of experiment, find a surface response. So now we're going to be able to go much faster, try to find the best thing. So we can call many times to get the surface response. It goes fast. And then once we have the right information, then we go back and we can actually uh, make it uh, uh, get the optimization. So here is actually uh, uh, the, uh, an example, for example, or where we have done just a parametric solution and where we are going to, we try to find a surface, a surface response. Now, the parametrization is done blindly. So I have, uh, I don't know, so many parameters and I'm going to, I'm going to go, all, I'm going to scan all those parameters in the different direction. So it's going to be, whatever, if I have 10 parameters, uh, 10 variations for one parameter times 10 variations for another times 10 for another one, I get 1,000 times step. So uh, here, not the time step, but samples. So here we see we have a parametric uh, study where we had 15,616 uh, samples. Now, if I use the uh, function of guide uh, that will try to find a, a, a surface, uh, uh, try to do a, a better job of optimizing the uh, uh, findings of the, the, the surface response, actually, it will be able to guess the variation and it will be able to cast the number of parameters that you really have to do. So from, for, from the same exact problem, using those two different methods, here I have 15,616 solutions in FEM, here I, don't have only, I only have 2,074, so it's quite important, seven times less almost. Huh? And uh, so of course, if you look at the time, we, get, we find the exact same optimal at the end, but one is found in uh, little more than 17 hours, the other one is just a little more of 1,000 hours. So that's another way that, uh, uh, that's one of the other things that Gallit offers you using different method, uh, advanced method. So it's coupling with Flux. <coughs> through a coupler. So I'm going to actually uh, show you this in a minute. What we'll see is we, we can actually define a coupling uh, tool inside Flux, uh, and then uh, we have communication, then got it becomes the controller once we open, and it calls Flux whenever it needs to do the job. Uh, so that's just an idea of how you actually do uh, to do an optimization uh, problem. You basically design the first, uh, you look at the first geometry, you try to analyze the first geometry for whatever you want, then you, get, you create the coupling, then in Flux, you actually, in uh, Got It, you import the Flux communicator, and then you run the optimization. So let's uh, try to look at it. As fast, as well as I can. So here I have a problem, and in fact, this is a type of problem which is uh, interesting. We, um, I have a, a brushless machine here. And uh, what I'm trying to do is, uh, I, I do not want to have harmonics and things like this, so what I'm going to try to do is limit the harmonic of the flux density inside the air gap. So that's the initial problem. Uh, we can see, well, let's just uh, make it look so that it's a real machine. Right there. Okay, so you can see that this was solved. I have uh, all the, so in this case, we solve only from the permanent magnet flux, there is no coil, nothing like this, okay? And, uh, but if I look, I'm, I'm going to look at the variation of the flux density along this line, and that's this curve here, and you can imagine, you have all those uh, T effect, of course, uh, slotting effect, and, and this is actually going to, it adds harmonic inside the signal. So if I do an FFT of this, harmon of this uh, signal here, so first, the uh, the full signal. This is actually the full signal signal on the on the uh, full uh, cycle, uh, geometric cycle. And if I look at the spectrum, so I have a very strong fundamental. Okay, so that's cool. But then I have a third harmonic, and I have a fifth. I have almost none of the six. I have seven, etc. The six, nine, uh, six, uh, whatever, six, uh, nine, twelve, etc. We don't we don't really care. They're going to cancel each other anyway. Um, but so now we want to maybe uh, limit this one and, and more 5, 9 and 11. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create 
I'm going to compute out of flux all those different harmonics. I'm going to send them to Garlic. And inside Garlic, I'm going to create a functional that will say, OK, you need to make this as small as possible. So to create the, uh, uh, create the connection inside the solving, so I can do this before the solving or after the solving, I have components. And by the way, I didn't show it to you before, but look here. We have a component for Cortinus. We have a component for MATLAB Simulink. We have others here. We don't really care at this point. And we have a component for Got It. It's the one I want to actually do. Well, let's look at the component for Got It. So of course, a, a component would have a name. Uh, just give it a test or something like this. I don't really care. Uh, I can tell it if I want it to overwrite or not uh, the existing component if it's already there. I can select the directory where I want to, uh, where I want it to be solved. So actually, this directory for me was uh, quite good. Uh, so if I want to put it, I can put it right there. Uh, what was this here? Uh, the uh, component, so here I need to say, so I have defined a scenario. Why do I need a scenario? Uh, because the scenario is going to define uh, the, uh, uh, the, the solution I'm going to have to do. So here I only have one scenario, it was a multi-position type of things. And then I can actually, I need some time to add some, uh, some uh, command language that will, um, that will allow me to uh, compute what I need. So if, if I look at, uh, in fact, this is a good uh, opportunity to do this. Uh, let's look at the Python script I have here. And uh, for example, here I have a Python script that will help me compute the harmonics in the uh, in the uh, BN, in the uh, normal flux density. So you can see uh, I'm actually doing a curve BN on the path with the formula BN. So I'm actually computing BN. <coughs> And then what I do is I compute the spectrum analysis. And then what I'll do is that I'm going to uh, get the fundamental, the harmonic 3, harmonic 5, so I get all those information. And then I'm going to send those inside, inside the gullet. So that's the, the shell that will, uh, the Python, Python 5 that will actually uh, do this uh, solution here. And uh, and uh, here we go. So now I'm going to tell the program what I'm sending on one side and then what I'm actually getting out on the other. So I, I will have already uh, created uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, function that I want to exchange. So for example, um, out of the air, the component inputs that I'm going to have are all the parameters that are associated the one that I want to vary. So, for example, I will vary, uh, let's see, I should have things with the magnet. So, for example, the slot depth, I can add it, the tooth width, I can add it, uh, the slot opening, and things like this. So, I will add all of those. And then, uh, right here, I will uh, bring back everything that comes back from the other. So, eventually, some will be the same going out and in because we are, we are sending the information, but then we're taking them to do new, uh, new geometries and things like this. And then when all of this is done, well, that's it. Uh, and then I can go, in fact, I'm just going to close this here. And I can go directly inside the gullet. So again, I have it right here, so I can start it from here. It reappears. This morning it was not here, but uh, it's again here. And um, then I can create a new problem, but you know what, I already did it, so I'm not going to create a new problem in front of you. Um, well, actually, I could start uh, showing you how it starts. So let's do a new one. And uh, I'm going to do uh, something like this. And so the first thing I would do is create a connector. And so I need to go find my connector. Actually, this is the path, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the connector, so it's going to be connector uh, uh, so SP, uh, what is this? It's a surface permanent magnet machine. I just give the name I want, basically. I kept the C1 because I know how it's connected, it's, uh, it's saved and stuff like this. But here I, I need to find the project. So I'm looking for the F2G. So this is the one, well, I guess I'm not in the uh, directory where I wanted. Uh, let's go back to uh, this, this one here. 
and I need to find this connector. So this connector has this name here. It's F2G. That means the connector. Flux to got. Got it. Open. And so it gives me a lot of information uh, that I have here. It's going to bring all information right there that you can see out of the connector. It's telling me uh, where it is, what, what information of flux it's going to net, take. And here is what I'm bringing in, the slot opening. This is a, a transition, uh, it's actually, an, uh, I think it's a nickel on, uh, no, this is a transition of the depth of the slot opening. Uh, this is the gap, the next of the magnet, the electrical degrees of the <coughs> magnet, the, the tooth width slot uh, angles and uh, that's uh, something to shape the magnet and then on the other side those are the one I'm going to send back to flux and guess what they're ab absolutely the same and then all the information I'm bringing back here output descriptor this is uh, all things actually no those are the descriptor the output that I get out sorry and so those are all the information about the uh, uh, the harmonics of the signal okay so I basically have the geometry that I'm going to send back to Flux also, and then all the fundamental, all the harmonics that comes out from Flux to do the local computation. And once I have the connector, now I'm going to be able to actually create function and things like this. But let me just uh, open another project. So I'll close this one. Uh, now I don't want to modify. It. Thank you. And I'll open one uh, that is ready. No, no. Because it's not it's the right location, of course not. It would be too easy. You can, of course, you can um, you can set the directory where you want to work. You can do it wherever you want. So let's uh, let's take for example this one here. Open. Here we go. And so, as I said, we have here the same connector that uh, we have the same connector than before, right there with all the information exactly from before. And now out of there, I have all those parameters. And now you can see those parameters, I can actually define them, and I could have added them, and now I can define how they're going to vary, or things like this. So those are all my parameters. If I edit, uh, no, wait, here we go. Um, here you have the different parameters. You have the values they have when they were imported. And now what I can do is I can say, well, I want to vary them from this value to this value. And um, I can even put unit of measure. So why are the units uh, important? It's because uh, uh, you need to be able to, well, sometimes it's, it's good when you need to, you want to normalize some of those uh, information. So it's a little easier sometimes with unit of measure. But here I don't care. I'm going to say everything is per unit because I know what I want to do. And once I have varied, uh, I have put all of those things, then I can tell, I can ask the program how to, uh, uh, I can tell it how to vary it. So in this case, because I want to do something which is very fast, um, I'm just going to keep a few parameters on. So I have the, the total angle, um, the gap, and uh, what do I have? No, those are fixed. So the, the angle they fix, the gap is fixed. Uh, the shaping of the stuff is fixed. So basically, I only kept the length of the magnet, the slot opening, and uh, the two widths and the transition area of uh, the two. So I'm okay. I, I can validate things when I once I have done change. I can close. Now there is a function I need to enter. So the, those function I have different function here. So I've put everything for every single harmonic at this point. And I, I basically define a full function here. And this is the addition of all the, uh, the harmonics, but it is normalized. Okay? So I'm adding the square of all those harmonics. This is going to be my, my objective function. And what I'll do is I'll make it as close as possible from zero when I'm going to do it. And so you have all the addition of all the harmonics here. And then uh, we are dividing by the fundamental to the square, so we can actually, um, uh, we, can, uh, we are normalizing. So we're not working with very big numbers or very small numbers, but numbers that are close to one. That's an important part.
So, and then once I have done this, I can actually define a screening. So, uh, there are already a few screenings that are there, but let's define another one. So, I'll just uh, call it the screener demo 3. I'm not really sure where I am at this point, but, and now I can say, okay, I want to see the influence of the parameter on this function. So, here, the function that I can look at is, for example, the harmonic function, the target function that I just did before. I put it here. And now I have two ways of screening. I can screen straight for each value. So I'm taking each value as such, or I can screen also for each value and the product between those values. So let's just take one uh, first. And once I have done this, I need to define the type of screening. So as you can see, there are a lot of screening. Maybe some of you are, are uh, custom, I mean, know some of those. Uh, they're all associated to statistic. Yeah? If you've done optimization or statistic, maybe you know those. Uh, one probably of the most famous method is the Taguchi. Okay, but here we can, let's just do just a box and uh, let's see. So every of those, if you look at the tooltip, for example, I take box 8, and it says this is for 8 experiments with a number of n factor between 3 and 4 and 2 levels. So it's basically telling you this is for this number of parameters, and uh, with this number of variations. So just remember, I'm going to have, I have, uh, what did I take? Four parameters, I have variation, but I, the program is going to decide how many it needs to do in each. So it's so that it goes faster, so I don't have to develop a full DOE. Uh, I can just go directly to the, uh, the correct information. So let's, uh, I think the eight actually is uh, one. Some of those computations may be not feasible because it creates to an invalid geometry or stuff like this. And then once I have done this, I'll just say validate. Okay, and now I can say execute. And here is the result. So that was actually quite fast because I already had some computation, so I'm kind of cheating a little. And this is the important part, is that whatever computation we've done before, they're going to be used by Garlic to try to find the result much faster. So remember, I'm trying to limit the number of harmonic. So what is it telling me? It says, if I, augment, if I increase the slot opening, I'm going to increase the function objective. I guess it makes sense. If you open the slot opening, you're going to create stronger harmonic in the, in the normal flux density, okay? And then it says, if the uh, length of the magnet increases, it's going to reduce the number of harmonics. You know why? Because if I increase the length of the magnet, I increase the gap. And now I have uh, more, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, such a strong uh, effect going there. So this was just for one. Well, let's do the same one uh, with, the, uh, with the product also, see if this brings us something. So validate and execute. So now when I do the product, so it has a few other information. So first it's very funny, the magnet now seems to be working in a different way. Well, why? I don't know. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's uh, kind of a funny way, but it's uh, the way it actually uh, 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 worked all the things together. Uh, the, the tooth width, for example, if I increase the tooth width, I'm going to um, decrease the function, so that also makes sense because I'm going to open uh, the, uh, the tooth to have more flux going through and probably I will have uh, less uh, intensity or I will have less effect, uh, uh, less, less starting effect probably. Anyway, so you get all of those things that are right here. You can see it actually goes quite fast. And uh, now once we have done this, and I'm not going to make them uh, go because this takes a long time, so after we can do a lot of things uh, uh, using all those functions, but of course you can also do optimization. And so the optimization, we've done two optimization, but they're basically genetic algorithms in this case. So I will uh, spare you all the work that comes after, and let's, uh, in the uh, interest of time, let's actually go uh, that's not the right one. Yeah, it is actually. Let's look at a few examples. So first one, actually, this is one we have uh, for a very long time, where we want to minimize the loss. Okay, now that's not an example. That's just to tell you all of the things you can do. So minimize losses, minimize cognitor. 
improve efficiency, minimize time, response, right, time response, uh, heat treatment, reduce heating time, and you know there are a lot of things you can uh, uh, you can think of. This is actually a picture we had for a long time, uh, minimizing cooking torque by shaking the magnet. So what did I do here? Yeah, cooking torque minimization. So here we have a, a brushless PM machine, and we want to. So the objective function is minimize the cooking torque, but keep the performances the same. So we want to keep the same uh, B inside the inside the, the air gap, and we want to limit the saturation to 1.5 tesla. So one objective to constraint. And here you can see uh, this is actually. Uh, somehow, it's a genetic algorithm. You can see it here, and you can see the function uh, that works. So this says the objective function. Uh, the objective function is actually well. I guess I don't have it here. Uh, I don't know what it is here. It doesn't show it to me. But you can see uh, it took. Uh, uh, it went to 70% torque uh, ripple reduction in six hours, and uh, this was distributed on 20 cores. So. That's why you get only six hours. If you do it without this, genetic algorithm takes a very long time. And uh, if you look at the results, this is the initial uh, torque, kerning torque, and once it's optimized, here we are. So definitely something that happened. Uh, here is the design comparison, and you can see it basically shaped the magnet to actually go there. It also closed a little the uh, slot, and it widened the teeth. Magnet weight reduction, that's uh, one I like uh, for a long time. And uh, magnet weight reduction, it uh, means that uh, we're going to minimize the surface of the magnet. Uh, the, the surface is directly in relation with the weight, uh, something we've already shown in the past. We have all of those things here. Uh, I think I'm going to go fast on this one. Uh, basically, we, uh, we went from a derated the motor to uh, 50, 450 square millimeters to 264, you can see how all this changed. Uh, that just explains what changed. I'm going to skip this one. Motor efficiency. Uh, this is actually a case that was done by Sheffield University. And uh, that is uh, uh, kind of a mix between uh, synchronous solutants machine and the brush, uh, just permanent magnet machine. You can see those slots. Those slots are filled with uh, magnet. Uh, so what we're going to play is on the thickness of each of those layers. Uh, the, the two fluids, the, the uh, uh, back iron. And what we do, we optimize it using the new European driving cycle. So those driving cycle, it's for automotive. And what it's going to do, it's going to define what uh, condition the machine is going to go through. So you start the motor, you start the car, you start driving, you accelerate, you stop, you go up the hill, you go down the hill. Um, I mean, anything you can see on the way. And so what we want is that in all conditions we, we get the best efficiency. And now you can see this was done in a different uh, uh, type of iteration. And you can see how the, uh, uh, the first time uh, the uh, samples are very uh, distributed. Uh, because you have to go through two other cycles. So just think about all those things. And then as we get closer, uh, they get uh, all together and finally we settle to the end of a 94.5% efficiency, which, uh, uh, which, by the way, it's much better even than the machine initially. But not only is it better, but it's going to work for all the different parts of the cycle of the, of the machine. Now, this is 36 hours for five parameters of optimization. So, 36 hours, okay? This was not distributed. Today we would do this much faster because we can do distribution. But if you were doing it by hand, you probably would still be doing it today. Induction machine optimization. So here we have two different optimizations. The first one is to improve the starting torque, torque. And the constraint is to keep the rated torque at 17 Newton there. So we want to make the starting torque better but we want to keep the same performance at rated speed. And the second one is to maximize the torque at different uh, load case. So close to start, a little after, 
close to locked, and so that's right at the start, rated uh, somewhere around here, and uh, breakaway or maximum torque, which is right there. And the constraint we have there is that no matter what we do, we want to maintain the efficiency at rated speed. So no matter what, we maintain the efficiency. That's the information about the rotor itself, uh, the machine itself. So the first optimization, improved starting torque, keeps the torque uh, uh, at over 17 Newton meters. Here it is. So that's the initial geometry. This is the optimized geometry. So that makes sense also if you think about because lock, lock rotor torque is created by the top, the, the, the top of the bar. And when we have a double bar like this, it will be the, the, the bar which is closest to the agap that works. And then um, the rated condition are actually uh, ensured by the bottom of the bar. So what did it do? Well, it makes the top rotor bar much bigger. Then to limit efficiency, it made this one smaller, but to keep the torque, it, uh, meant it, it made it uh, deeper. So now this is the other one where we're going to optimize that 0.034, this is a rated speed. 0.25, this is a breakaway torque. And 0.95, this is right towards the beginning. And you can see here the different, uh, and, and remember, we, this was with the efficiency that needs to be the same. So we can see efficiency or rated speed needs to be the same. Uh, okay, this one actually we kind of uh, messed it up uh, because it's, uh, it's such in a way that it was not able to maintain the efficiency. But here you can see the shape of the slots that were found for all of those. Cogging force minimization, this is, just on, um, this is just on the regular, oh yeah, I should be careful here. This is just on the regular uh, linear motion uh, type of tool, uh, type of actuator. And what we want is to minimize the uh, the cogging force as you go uh, as you go through, you don't want the uh, saturation to go too high, and you want to have the same flux density. But then we can play on the width of the teeth, the uh, spacing between the teeth, the, the width of the slot, and stuff like this. And here we go. Uh, so it gives you. Uh, it found actually two different optimums here, uh, and you can see the result, the initial result of the force, and then when it's optimized. And then we can see the different back EMF. Healing optimization, so I'll go through this very quickly. So no, this one I don't care because we're going to talk about it later, I think. Or not quite, but it doesn't matter. Healing process here. Uh, here we want to shape the coil so that we have an uniform distribution of temperature on the surface of the load. So same idea here, so we want the temperature to be between 750 degrees C and 760 degrees C on the surface, and, but uh, we want also to uh, limit the time heat, and so we want to do it the best way possible. And again here, uh, that's uh, the initial. You can see the initial, it was only hitting right this part. This, this is the optimized, so the coil was actually moved a little lower. The air gap here is actually limited, and now we have something which is uh, quite better here. Okay, and now finally, uh, because optimization costs a lot of money, not uh, of time, uh, now we have actually come up with uh, a solution to make uh, this faster. So initially we worked on multi-core solving, so one core, uh, one, one PC but many cores, this is something we do today uh, for the solving, when you do uh, in 3D, some of the solving is, uh, is vectorized or parallelized. <coughs> And, uh, and so it can make use of all the different cores that are available on the machine to go faster. What we did is uh, something different. We actually took uh, the computation. So if you think about it, it's a multi-parameter computation. And so what we are going to do is we're going to send flux on different PCs or flux on different cores. So now we're going to use whatever power is available to us to do this stuff. So instead of doing only one solving, we're going to do n solving on n PC or n core. Doesn't matter. That's called the uh, CDE. So it's working with GLADI2 and 11.1. And uh, now know that uh, so you have machines and multiprocessors in the machine, multi cores. So you multiply the number of uh, of, uh, of uh, possibility uh, doing this computation. 
And so if we look at how better it goes, no, that's not how fast, okay? You know, you would think that uh, if I increase the number of cores, my time will go down. That's the case. But what I'm plotting here is the computation gain. So what it says is that if I have a problem with, uh, with uh, five cores, I'm going to make it go three times faster. So instead of uh, 15 minutes, it's going to be only five minutes to actually get the solution. And of course, this is shown for a 2D motors or a 3D transformer. So the way it actually works is that Gotit is the controller of all of this. So whatever machine Gotit is installed on, on, it will identify all the many computation it needs to do. And it will then send the list of computation on a, ma on, on a master node. This master node will know that it needs to do 200 computation in different ways and so it's going to look on the network what's available of course the the computer needs to be authorized otherwise it will not work and so then it will actually send all the information manage it and once all of this is done it sends the information back to got it all put together ready to use okay that's the part uh, let's show you how to do it and things like this but uh, you have some information that tells you the progress bar on the different cores, you can follow all of those things. You can see how the, the different solutions are getting uh, done and stuff like this. So this is actually very, very useful for anything which is associated to optimization. Screening go much faster. Genetic algorithm, I'm not even talking about it, it goes so much faster. Uh, so this is uh, true for 2 d magnetic, electric, thermal application, static, steady state application, transient application. Uh, it is not available for couple solutions, so you cannot do magnetothermal and things like this. You can do one or the other. Okay. Also important here, time stepping computation are not uh, distributed, so it doesn't make a solving go faster. What it does is that if you have multi parameters, it's going to go much faster. And you know what? This is all the little stuff. Uh, I don't really care about all of this. And uh, that's 